Welcome to Full Circle. I'm Suzanne McAllister. Coming up in our music segment today, we have a song which I have always enjoyed. It's called Lean On Me. So be sure and stay with us for that uh, performance. Um, but first, you know, we are going to talk about addictions and many people lean on alcohol, drugs, and even gambling to uh, get that fix for their addiction. So that's our subject for today and our expert is Dr. Donald Osborne. Dr. Osborne, and I'm going to read his title here, he's a professor of counseling and the director of graduate addictions counseling at Indiana Wesleyan University. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So are more people interested in addictions and the process of addiction and why certain people are more prone to addictions? Yeah, there's, there's two aspects of that. One, of course, that you've just mentioned from the clinical side. There's always the research that's going on as to uh, what happens to an individual to where they become out of control? Is it brain? Is it uh, behavior? Is it their ability to process alcohol or the drug? And the other aspect of it is, is from the, a patient or client perspective, is that they're sitting there in your office, they've never planned on being in this situation or this condition, and they ask the question, how did I get here? what happened and what went on in, inside of me or my life. So as a doctor who you are dealing with that situation, how do you answer that question? Well, there's several things that we begin to look at. First of all, is there a genetic component? The aspect of, of talking about the disease of addiction is still controversial. We'll hear the word mentioned many times where you have a disease the thing that I caution people about in those conversations is that there's multiple definitions of disease. Plus the other thing, when we begin to look at alcohol per se, how is it that out of all of the drugs that were available, let's say, that alcohol is the only one that causes a disease? Why is there not cocaineism? Why is there not methamphetamineism? Um, so the aspect of what I look at in the disease component is the person susceptible to a particular drug? In other words, they don't process it like other people it's more would. Physical more than physical, more physical, mental situation. Exactly. Going on. Okay. And one of the things I would I would point out as an example there, it's it's like a person who's lactose intolerant. Uh, of course, the other thing, when we look at disease, it can cause other body issues as well, like enlarging of the heart liver problems as well. So when we talk about disease, there are diseases that are a result of addiction in that regard. So it really is complex. It, 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 it's very complex. Multiple levels, family history, stress, pain, environment. physical environment. Yep. So as you uh, talk with someone who has an addiction that really has almost given over their life to their addictive behavior, what do you suggest in terms of regaining that control in their life? One of the things that I will do with individuals in just a very you know, conversational way is I will find out from them where they see they needed to have the drug or they needed to engage in the behavior because as you were saying, gambling, there are process addictions. There's sexual addiction, uh, there's eating disorders, we try to find out what the, the purpose of the drug was for them. Where I gravitate to, and what I tell a lot of my students as well as when I speak at conferences and workshops as well, is there comes a point in time when people try to deal with some aspect of pain in their life. And that's where the, the drug use or the behavior comes into play to have that emotional vacation or to kind of break away or check out of life or not be responsible to numb the pain that's going on in their life. And that's where we get into there's the addiction, but there's the pain that translated into an addiction that they're trying to deal with or self-medicate. I talk about the pain pleasure principle that perhaps an addictive behavior might be pleasurable at, at one point, but then if it gets out of control, it can move into pain. It can it can numb the pain, right. but it it can become the source of the pain as well. It, and that's one of the the things that becomes kind of full circle for people is that I'm trying to avoid a pain that happened in my life, uh, an abusive situation, a disappointment 
but they engage in the drug or the addictive behavior to the point that now it causes all these, you're right, all these other pains in life. Sure, and you know, I, I took this off of Wikipedia, um, that an addiction can be defined when the engagement in the activity or experience affects the person's quality of life mm -hmm. in some way. So really it's when somebody just gives over their life to that addictive behavior. You surrender to it. Uh, and, but the thing about addictions is it's very subtle, is that, as I said earlier, I've never met any patient, any client, uh, any family member in all of my years that said, you know, when I grow up, <laughs> I would like to be an alcoholic or I would like to be you know, addicted to uh, gambling. Um, they see it as just kind of a subtle, harmless behavior. But there's three aspects about addiction that I always try to look at with people. Are they compulsive in it? Have they lost control? And even in the aspect of negative consequences, they still continue to engage or use in the behavior. So before we take a break, if sure. somebody has identified themselves in one of those three things that you just said, what might be a good first step? First step that I would say would be obviously to call a community mental health center, call their pastor, uh, call Indiana Wesleyan University at our, at our clinic that we have, and just make a contact with the person to talk about that, assess it further, and begin to maybe have a, a more fuller conversation about that with someone. Sure, have no shame, have no fear. No. We are about helping people connect and get informed, and we will continue with Dr. Osborne after this. Welcome back to Full Circle. We are continuing to talk with Dr. Don Osborne. He's a professor of counseling at Indiana Wesleyan University. We're talking about uh, addictions, the effects of addiction, not only on the person who has the addiction, but let's shift to how a person that is addicted, that behavior can affect an entire family. Now what do you do? Sure. Two things that we will usually see that come up in a, in a family structure is the individual that is uh, the identified client that we would say in this regard, uh, has probably no awareness uh, in their own perception of what it is that they're doing to the family, but the family members begin to change their behavior. They're walking on eggshells. Um, there are those aspects that we do see that where they become out of control. There's abuse at some level, physically, uh, emotionally, that goes on in the family. And in having those conversations with family members, um, it is almost as if they have been traumatized in sure. a way. Uh, their lives have changed to the point that they begin to kind of lose contact with their own personal enjoyment and their own growth. It begins to inbreed into the family behavior and things begin thus to break down. So what I begin to look at with families is when they come in, is how where the individual is of their own addiction and of their own use. There have been those occasions where I've had family members, and I've instructed them to do this, you have a cell phone, you have a video camera. If the person is under the influence of alcohol or another drug, videotape it and bring it to the session. And we will show that back to those individuals and just tell me, what do you see? And I think maybe years ago, some folks can identify with this, David Hasselhoff, sure, I remember his, that incident. his children did that to him. And so that's one of the things that we look at to show a reality. The other aspect that can happen with addictions is that the spouse, on many occasions, in many ways, feels as if the drug or the addictive behavior, let's say sexual addiction, has become the mistress or has become you know, the, it's the adulterated, the yeah, it's, Absolutely. there's this aspect of kind of an emotional adultery that goes on. And so they begin to feel as if they have this anger that goes on with them. They're trying to get control of their life and their family, but there's really no one to go get mad at or drive up and pound on their door aspect. 
So the drug becomes another person in a way of the desire and the behavior of one of the family members, uh, particularly with children. And this is another difficult conversation, is that sometimes the family has to make a decision that the individual that's using the drug, even if it's a child, can no longer be in that home because it's destructive, it's always drama, it's always chaos that's going on. Because you have to move past denial, you have to move past inactivity, mm -hmm. and you have to move towards some type of a corrective cure. Right. Whether, I, whether it's the addictive person's behavior or the family members around them. Right. And that's one of the things that I will have a conversation with is that you as a family need to work on your health. And if that means that the person needs to move out or they go to their own devices, it's a prodigal son mm -hmm. scenario in sure. many aspects, is that we hope and pray for the day that they'll wake up in the pig pen and say, how did I get here? And then begin to want to do something about it. So many years ago, we used to call this tough love, whether yes. it's tough love with your child or your still spouse. The same. Or, still. It is still the same. But you know, sometimes people resist that. They don't have the courage in their own right to do that. It's a difficult conversation to have with mothers and fathers who love their children because another dynamic that happens in this is that they blame themselves. They see themselves that they failed. And that's not always the case. Um, not saying maybe they've been perfect, but there is a reality that takes place that this person in your family, they made choices as well, contrary to your wishes or how you raise them or the family values that you have. Or all of the codependency that works amidst that yes. whole dynamic yes. with, with the family unit. Yep. There's so many layers to this, and we certainly can't um, touch upon all of these subjects, but we have more to cover with our guest, Dr. Osborne, right after this. Stay with us. talk about the subtle and perhaps not so subtle effects of addiction in our own lives, in our families' lives. Dr. Donald Osborne is our expert today. I think part of the co complexity of addiction is that there's generally not just one thing to say, this is what caused it. Exactly. And one of the things that I do with, with students or with uh, working with clinicians is that we try to do what we call a biopsychosocial spiritual. Um, and I know that you're familiar with that as, as well. It's, it's an intake document. It's, it's an interview of a client. And we will interview their family history, their medical history, the environment that they're in, uh, their, their spiritual formulation or their faith foundations that go on. And we'll also find out what stressors are going on in their life. So it could be all of those areas. It could be one of those areas or a couple of those areas. But that, as we were saying, makes you know, the complexity of all of this is trying to look at how did this started, where did it come from? Is it you know, biological or is it just because you hung out with the wrong group of people when you were 15 years old and it continued to lead into progressively more degenerative behavior? Sure, absolutely, because we are a byproduct of our, our life's choices. Mm -hmm. right. And I think that's a good example of that. So um, I understand that there's a, a research project that you might be involved in, and it explores uh, exorcisms and mm -hmm. uh, demonic beings that can mm -hmm. sometimes be the cause of a person's issues. I'll just keep it broad sure. like that. What are you able to say at this point, given that the research project is still down the road? Well, there's two aspects of the research. There's, uh, you know, the personal experience that I have gone with in my years in being an ordained minister, uh, my work in mental health. I've also worked in the Department of Corrections. That you encounter individuals with behavior that is beyond just um, 
what I would say, you know, sociopathic kind of behavior. There's an aspect of evil, and of course, of what we're seeing in the world right now uh, is an increase in behavior of where evil actions are taking place. So I have also looked at the work of M. Scott Peck, who is a psychiatrist that became a Christian. Uh, many people may be familiar with his book, The Road Less Traveled. But prior to that, he was actually writing a book called People of the Lie, which was a study of evil. Um, I've read that book. I've had opportunity to meet with Dr. Peck and have a discussion with him. Uh, the work of Dr. Wayne Oates at uh, Louisville uh, Seminary and Southern Baptist Seminary uh, and some of his work in that there is a dynamic that begins to take place that as we begin to look in psychiatry, we begin to look in mental health, there is that focus now that's becoming, is there something really spiritual to this that's going on and what's taking place in a person's life? Right, right. And um, we look at, you know, if we go, go back to the, the world of Plato, uh, to be very simple here, he believed in a dual world. There's the seen, there's the unseen, or the, the material, the physical, or the spiritual, the invisible. And uh, Paul, even in his writing, said that we fight against principalities and powers of the air that are unseen. Um, and so the aspect going back many years ago, or the, the book in the case of Father Bowerden in St. Louis of the Exorcist is the first documented case. So to bring all of this together, it is an issue that has been of personal interest of mine, uh, both as a minister, as a therapist, uh, but also looking at it from the perspective of what more do we need to investigate and study and look at as we understand human behavior and the influences on people and even from a faith or a lack of a faith system. Well, you have certainly expanded our thinking. It's not <laughs> only what we can see, but it is the unseen as well. I'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Donald Osborne. Dr. Osborne is a professor of counseling and the director of graduate addictions counseling at Indiana Wesleyan University. Fascinating information. Thank you for having me. Well, we are back with Lean On Me after this. Stay tuned. Musical Showcase is coming up next. And now, here's our Musical Showcase. We are back. Thanks for watching today. I hope our discussion about addictions has made you become more aware of your options for treatment. Well, now here's a touch of grass with Lean On Me. I'm Suzanne McAllister, and I'll see you next time, Full Circle.
you don't understand we all need somebody to lean on lean on me when you're not strong and i'll be your friend i'll help you carry on for it won't be long till i'm gonna to lean on you just call on me brother and i'll understand we all need somebody to lean on lean on me when you're not strong and i'll be your friend and i'll help you That you can't carry I'll ride up the road I'll share your load Well, if you just call me You just call me Call me If you need a friend, I call me You just call me I'm gonna be right now 